This morning is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. I want you to hear God's word for us today. Six days later, Jesus took him, Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord, meet us in this place. Quiet our hearts and our minds. Open our ears and our eyes to see you and hear you. May your words be my words this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is a defining moment in Jesus' ministry with his disciples. The moment that their eyes were open and they had a clear vision of who Jesus was. The 12 have been with him a while now. They've heard his teaching, witnessed a few miracles, even heard his predictions about his impending death and resurrection. But in typical disciple fashion, they didn't fully comprehend all that they had seen and all that they had heard. But now, as Jesus takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, those who would be instrumental in the spreading of the good news after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, a clear vision is received as to who Jesus truly is as he takes them on a journey up to a high place to spend some time in prayer. I can imagine for Peter, James, and John, this was a normal occurrence. Going with Jesus to pray, spending a little extra time learning at his feet. After all, they were his closest friends. Of course, they would be included in some intentional prayer time. Yet this adventure was different and amazing. Jesus took him, Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Can you even begin to imagine what that would have been like? There, right before your eyes, Jesus' appearance changes. His robe turns white, and it says, dazzling bright. No one on earth can make them that white. So no matter how much bleach you use or how much you soak it, this is white, 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 bright. His robes turn white, and he has a glow about him like the bright sun. Incredible enough, I am sure, just to see that. But there was more. He was in conversation with Moses and Elijah. No question who they were. They were the disciples. They didn't have pictures at the time. They didn't know what they looked like, but they knew without a doubt that Moses and Elijah were there. What an unbelievable scene as Peter, James, and John look on in awe. Because you see, Moses and Elijah were held in great esteem by the Jewish community. Their, pres <clears throat> their presence represents both the law and the prophets. All of the Old Testament writings basically can be summed up in these two persons. It is believed that they would return as a foreshadowing of the coming of Messiah. And now the three disciples were standing as witnesses to Jesus as the Messiah, the one who is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Moses, we know him, right? He's the one that God gave the law to. You might recall Moses went up Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments when the nation of Israel was wandering through the desert. <clears throat> As he met 
the, on the mountain with God, his face received a peculiar glow from being face to face with God. Moses, as he went down the mountain, began to wear a veil so that he wouldn't frighten the people. But his face was a glow from his time face to face with God. Here on the mountain again, Jesus is now a glow in God's presence. Elijah, he was the one who connects the earlier charismatic prophecies of the days of Samuel with the later writers of the prophets. Elijah also went up to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, to meet with God. One of my favorite stories is that of Elijah on the mountain. He is told by God to go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. As he did, there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. God was in the silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Elijah, too, met with God face to face on the mountain. Moses and Elijah, they had their encounters with God on the mountain, and that does not end their stories, and it does not end their similarities. You see, both of these men are have gone up to heaven with God from the mountain. Moses was last seen by the Israelites before they entered the promised land on the top of Mount Sinai. He was not permitted to lead the people to that place, and he said his goodbyes as he overlooked the future resting place of God's people. It is believed that Moses was taken directly up to heaven from that place, since his final resting place has never been found. While Elijah, we know, was taken up directly to heaven from the top of Mount Horeb, the tradition was that Elijah would return as a front runner to the Messiah, telling people of his returning soon. So here on the mountain of the Lord, we have the coming together of the representation of law and prophets, indicating the greatness of Jesus, who transcends both as the one who is declared the Son of God. And so we continue in this scripture, and Mark tells us that Peter speaks up. Peter always speaks up, kind of inappropriately a lot of the times, right? So Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you. He did not know what to say because he was terrified. I think we can all relate to Peter, right? We, we, we are uncomfortable, so we just say whatever comes to mind. That's, that's a good description of Peter. But terrified, I'm sure, doesn't even begin to truly express what Peter, James, and John were feeling. Peter was trying to make sense of it and was seeing what's going on and offering to pitch a tent for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And I'm sure he was thinking that this meeting might last for a while. They might be here for a couple of days. He could, he, how could he be of use? How could he be of more use than to pitch a tent? Instead of standing there with his mouth open, going, oh my gosh, do you see what I see? Is this really happening? His babbling, though, was interrupted by a light, radiant cloud that enveloped them and a voice sounding from deep in the cloud. As the disciples stood there, now together on the mountain, God once again spoke. And God said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus' transfiguration echoes his baptism. If you recall, as he was coming up out of the water, a voice was heard saying, this is my beloved, whom I am well pleased. Here on the mountain of God, God's voice is heard again. Those words with a different ending. This is my son, marked by my love focus of my delight, listen to him. There's a command that comes, listen to him. The glory of God filled the space around them, wrapping them in light. And just as quickly as everything had appeared, it was all gone. 
the cloud, the light, the voice, Moses, Elijah, all vanished. And as they look around, they see no one but Jesus standing before them. Their focus is now exclusively on Jesus the Messiah, the way Moses and Elijah would have desired for them to be. For their ultimate significance was in preparing for the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God and his redemptive mission. There on that mountaintop, the three disciples were given a clear vision of who Jesus truly was witnesses to the coming together of the Old Testament forebears of the coming Messiah. All the other things that, have ha have, that they have witnessed up to that point were now put into perspective. They, were, they had preconceptions of what the Messiah was to be, which I believe hindered them from seeing who Jesus actually was. In fact, they were so close to Jesus physically that they could not seem to grasp the enormity of his incarnation. After they shared meals with this man, they walked and talked with him as her teacher and their friend. They believed him to be God's Messiah, the divinely anointed deliverer of Israel, but it still was not clear as to what that entailed. It was this encounter that clarified their vision of Jesus as the divine Messiah. Their focus was now on Jesus and his mission. Sometimes I think it is our own closeness to Jesus that can keep us from clearly seeing who he really is. We are privileged to have a closeness to him through the teachings and writings in the pages of scripture and over 2,000 years of theological reflect reflections that we have at our fingertips. We know the story. We know the history, the eyewitness accounts. We know how his journey ends and that his end is our beginning as we look forward to the day that he, we will be reunited with him in heaven. But I truly think that all of us, that we all can cloud our vision, keeping us from, truly, from clearly seeing Jesus in the world around us. One scholar wrote, when we see him for who he truly is as the incarnate son of God, it promises for us a completely new way of looking at reality. Jesus is, as John's gospel states, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is not just the only way to the Father, but he is the sole truth that brings reality into focus, and he has the sole access in this world to the kind of life that allows us to live the way God intends us to live. If Jesus is the Son of God, which his transfiguration declares him to be, then it demands that we view everything through his ordering of the world. It is about how we view the world through the lens of our faith. Our worldview will never be the same if we allow Jesus to transform our view of reality. Everything changes when we shift our focus and have a clear vision, whether it is the realm of religion or science or economics or politics or even society. Our view of this world will be transformed when we place Jesus the Son of God, the Messiah, at the center of our reality. Not only our ideologies, but also our daily priorities, our values. We all need to be evaluated in the light of Jesus in our lives. For the three disciples that day, their vision became clear. They saw who Jesus was, understood his message, recognized him as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the focus of their worldview was now through the lens of Christ. So how is your vision? Do you see Jesus clearly? Jesus, the Messiah, the one who came to change the world, the one who fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, both the law and the prophets. Jesus is more than a friend. He is a savior. He's our redeemer. And friends, we need to open our eyes and see without fear the full confidence that God is working through us to change the world.